transportation services API and how that relates to retiring the BSD socket API. Please give him a great round of applause and uh, I'm welcoming him to the stage. Hi, so my name is Phil or Philip Tiesel. Um, and I'm today here to talk about TAPS, the Transport Socket Services API. Um, all the work I'm presenting today is work in progress. So it has become a fairly large group of people working on that, and it's really awesome how much traction it got, but it's still work in progress. So we have no RFC yet. We are just talking about internet drafts and preliminary stuff we are doing for the API. But on the other hand, we have already have a few implementations and it's really nice seeing how much traction this gets. But before talking about why I want, we want to replace the BSD socket API or want to retire it, let's see what's wrong with that. So looking at the BSD socket API, um, we have to be go back in its history. And you see the BSD socket API originates from 4.2 BSD from 1983. I was two years old when this was released. Um, and therefore, it has become quite old. Um, at this time, it was, they were really very strong in the idea of everything is a file. And as we had no, didn't have virtual file systems yet in this time, they decided, okay, if we want to do networking, just make it a file handle and have, instead of an open call, the socket call, and everything works like a file. And it was m implemented as an extension for uh, inter-process communication. So instead of doing inter-process communication on a single machine, we're now doing it over the new shiny internet which was quite small at this place and time and worked, yeah, as an experiment. And they decided to say we have two uh, kinds of APIs for inter-process communication, a message-based, you can easily also create in a Unix domain socket, and a stream-based. And for this, they implemented the user datagram protocol, UDP, which is unreliable, and the transport control protocol, TCP, which is reliable stream. And as this was the first real, real API that ought to be usable, and uh, it doesn't require to fiddling with network drivers or putting assembler code into code, that, but enabled everyone who was able to write a file to also do network inter-process communication, it became the template of most modern networking APIs. If you look at the BSD socket API and look at the Windows socket API uh, or other socket APIs on embedded platforms, they look quite the same. They are all modeled after the original BSD socket API. So let's see what we need to open a socket. <laughs> this is the classical example from Stevens at all Unix network pro programming. Um, this is still the reference on how to do this. So you first create an integer variable to put the socket file descriptor, as file descriptors are integers. Then you reserve a struct for the, um, the name resolution, configure it a little bit, and call get other info with all this stuff and to get the return parameters. Now you have a linked list of stuff that allows you to, co um, um, to, um, to connect and has the results of the name resolution. If it fails, you get an error, and then it gets worse. You start a while loop iterating about this list and trying, can I connect the socket? If it works, we're fine. If it, uh, if it doesn't work, try the next one. We try to connect. If it works, we're fine. If it doesn't work, it blocks, it timeouts, and we go to the next row and try, try the next one. Afterwards, we have a socket file descriptor. We have a special free that allows us to free the whole list, and we're done. So.
So, simple question, what's wrong with that? And I'm not thinking about modern APIs, but just on what's wrong if you accept that C is programmed that way, what's still wrong with that? And the, question, the answer is, today's internet transport has changed. We're not in 1983 anymore, and therefore, a few things changed. First, we have much more, many more protocols out there than just TCP and UDP. At the narrow waist of the internet, we now have IPv4 and IPv6, and not IPv4 anymore. At the transport layer, we don't have, uh, we have SCTP as a reliable message-based protocol. We will become, qui uh, we will get quick pretty soon, so it's rolled out at the moment primarily from Google, but Akamai is on the way, and a lot of other uh, CDNs or contrast distribution networks are on the way to roll out this. So we'll have a second transport protocol pretty soon that is made for replacing TCP, at least if HTTP is on, the, on top of that. And probably you want to use this transparently. As the second change, we have devices that have multiple paths today. So if you had the mainframe in 1983, you were really lucky if you had a permanent connection to the internet and were not dialing it up through a 300 baud modem. Today, you have a cell phone that has multiple network interfaces, at least one cellular carrier and at least a Wi-Fi interface. Probably you can use multiple at the same time. And you might want to really decide on a per socket basis which path to use. And finally, you have multiple endpoints serving the same data. If you're, looking, if you're talking to Google or any other CDN, you just get the front-end cache. And you have several to choose from. And finally, last but not least, everything today should be encrypted. At the old days of the internet, everyone was trusted. We don't need to encrypt communication. You can trust the other uh, few hundred guys on the internet. You know them. Today, we need encryption to uh, save everything. And these are all things that were not thought of when inventing the BSD circuit API. So, let's look how we can fix that. We go to our textbook example again and have first to look at the name resolution. We want to re resolve names over multiple paths in parallel. And to make things worse, if you're talking to CDN nodes, uh, you cannot use the same IP addresses through all links, because if you have a Wi-Fi from the camp and, for example, a T-Mobile uh, um, LTE on the camp, both will most probably deliver you different DNS results for CDN nodes. And you might not be able to reach the other uh, CDN nodes at all for using the wrong link. So you have to resolve in parallel, you have to keep the results separate, and you have to, um, um, to use them in the right way. Um, the BSD Socket API doesn't provide this feature. So if you want to do this in an application, for example, in the web browser, you have to implement your whole DNS yourself. Welcome. Um, second, if we have results, these re uh, DNS results contain information that will be later on useful for your secure connection setup. If you want to do, use features like SNI encryption that allows, um, that pre prevents some observer on the path to see what host name you're connecting to, you have to get a key from DNS. The current socket API doesn't provide you this. You will need, a new, um, you will impl have to implement DNS yourself. So thing, if you want to connect users usually like fast connections. 
if you have to time out multiple times, if you have to time out 90 seconds per connection attempt, the user gets annoyed. If you click on the website on a link and it takes you three or five minutes to display something, the user is really, really angry. So what, you, what all browsers do today, or what you have to do today, if you want to be state-of-the-art, you have to try multiple connections in parallel. So you try IPv4 and IPv6 with a small head start for IPv6, wait which socket connects first, and use that one. So no loop anymore, but a fancy loop around select, who in this audience likes select or epoll or poll as a programming concept? Oh, we have quite a few. Um, so it really gets ugly to code this. And with things like quick emerging, we will have to do the same for the protocol. So this is ugly. Then we need to set up a secure transport, so for example SSL, which is not part of the socket API, but this is a separate library you're using, uh, and you se separately take to uh, care of that. And finally, you have to pass the transport protocol chosen, so if you use TCP or QUIC or whatever you use, back to the application because the socket may have slightly different semantics, whatever you chose. Um, I thought about presenting a code example of that, and we're looking for something. So there's no textbook example, there's nothing uh, on Stack Overflow, by the way. Um, the nicest and shortest example I found was in libcurl, and it was about 1,200 lines of code. Um, okay. So, how the heck do we solve that? Um, the usual idea of people asking that question say, oh, no way, there's no way of replacing the BSD socket API. Don't, just don't think about it, it won't work. Um, several researchers tried that and failed, and uh, I only have one reason why I'm hoping that this approach might succeed. Um, so why I'm standing here. Last year, a bunch of people uh, who got really annoyed about the BST Socket API because they broke their research code or were really ugly in their API design, um, met at the TEPS working group at the ITF and said, oh, we have to do something about this. And the group who initially met was first a bunch of academics and then Apple joined. And we're saying, oh yes, we built our new network API. We want to standardize it here, work together with you who all have worked on different aspects of this connection setup and of this automatic probing of different transport options. Let's work together and let's build something new. And they really are now trying to release their socket API or their new network framework. That's basically what we're currently standardizing at the ITF. Okay, I talked about the ITF. The ITF. What the heck is the ITF and what the heck is the TAPS working group? Um, first, the ITF is a standards body. That looks, sounds pretty boring. So a lot of people talking about standardization and how to interoperate with things. Um, not quite, because the ITF is a pretty unusual standard bodies. And also, if you visit the meetings, you will find out it's a pretty nerdy place. Um, I think these two quotes characterize the ITF pretty well. So the first is from David Clark and saying we reject kings, presidents, and voting, we believe in rough consensus and running code, which is quite unusual for standard body because usually uh, you either standardize something that someone else already had as a product or you're just standardizing something 
everyone agrees on and nobody knows whether it will ever be implementable. And the second one is be conservative in what you send and be liberal in what you accept. So if I want to interoperate with others, I should keep to the standard as much as possible, but I should be able to tolerate failures from what the others sent. Um, and also in, in the ways the ITF works, you see this is quite different from other standards bodies. So there's no voting shares for different companies, but there's individuals in a room that try to find consensus and they usually decide whether they get to consumption by humming. So instead of saying, oh, we ha raise our hands to vote, there's the question, who is in favor of the, f uh, the following proposal? Please hum now and you just get a feeling on how much the people humming in the room. And if you're really in favor of it, you can hum loudly and really for the full voice. You say, mm, okay, I can live with that, but it's not so convincing. You can hum uh, silently. And as it's a very deep voice, you can't really get who is voting for what. So it's in person, it's in the room, it's easily verifiable, and it's more or less anonymous. That's awesome. So, how's this ITF organized? First, it's divided into several areas. So, the um, applications in real time, or art area, is mostly concerned about how application protocols and on protocols that are doing real time transport. Then there's the general area, which is mostly concerned with stuff that touches everything else and doesn't fit in closely in one area. There's the internet area, which is really about the IP protocol version 6, and perhaps looking at what the uh, legacy IP needs for fixes. Uh, there's op the operations and management, which mostly talking about practice practices, how to manage networks. The routing area, which is mostly about BGP and other routing protocols. The security area, where things like TLS or IPsec get standardized. And the transport area. And this is the area we're talking about today because we are talking about transports like TCP, QUIC, SCTP. And this is also the area where TAPS works. So what's the TAPS working group? So the TAPS working group is by, the, by its own charter, concerned with transport services. It started off as a group of people mostly thinking about ways on how to actually deploy SCTP and get SCTP deployment. Um, but now with a few people joining and really talking about methods on how to choose sockets, really on talking about methods, how to use multiple access networks, it got a lot, lot more traction. So the name is is a little bit funny because um, who knows what TAPS means for a usual American. TAPS is the melody you usually play when a soldier on a soldier's funeral, uh, which was something because many Americans laughed about the, the, the TAPS working group. But today, as we try to retire the BSD socket API, it might get a different meaning now. Um, the idea is to enable application developers to use other protocols than TCP and UDP without too much caring about. So you don't want to rewrite your whole code if you want to use Quick instead of TCP. Actually, if it works, you just would like that it works. Just the same way you did it before. Um, we want to enable transport evolution and describe an API how to use transport services. Wait, API, ITF, isn't the ITF just standardizing protocols? Why APIs? So that's the reason why we really talk about an abstract API. And there's a really, really tight separation of concerns on what the ITF specifies in terms of protocols. The ITF specifies abstract protocols. So basically, what primitives are there? What are the basic interactions? Um, and APIs for concrete languages are usually made by their own standard bodies. So for example, if you look at the Unix C API, it's done by POSIX. 
uh, if you look at the Java API, there's um, the Java pr uh, community process for that. And therefore, what TAPS is doing as a, pro um, as a um, specification is just input for other standards bodies on how could we implement this in our language. And it's trying to have fairly broad and abstract concepts there that are usually somehow able to be mapped in every different language. So the, diff the APIs will look quite a little bit different and can neatly integrate within the language while you have still the same rough, same interaction patterns. And if you're going from, for example, Objective-C to Python, you will see a similar API, but that feels Objective-C on your iOS device and feels Python-esque on, on Python. That's the idea. So how does the standardization stuff work in the IETF? So we start with writing an internet draft. An internet draft is, for the academics from you, something like a tech report or something like an archive org paper. Everyone can submit that, everyone can write that. It has to go through the IETF processing tool chain and provide this beautiful ASCII text. Um, but otherwise, there are no real limitations for who and what you can do with an internet draft. And then you want to decide how do I want to publish it. And if, if it gets published, it gets an RFC number. So how do we do this? You can either say, I'm working, want to do this with, with, in a working group. Then you carry your internet draft to the working group and say, oh, I have written this draft. Do we want to work together on that and adopt it? as a working group item. And either the working group says, go away, we're not interested, or the working group says, oh, yes, it's fine. Uh, and the following five people also want to join you in working on that. And this is what we did for TAPS. There's also this uh, individual submission way where individuals can submit stuff, but that's rarely used for real stuff because mostly you, you're not writing RFCs alone. Um, then you get, uh, if you say, think it's ready, and you ask the related areas that are touching stu your stu stuff, please do a review. Look whether it works and whether you have insights that said it's a good or it's a bad idea. And then you iterate over it like, uh, till the other people are lucky. So this is always because this is the blue file. You iterate another round if someone is unlucky and if it doesn't find consensus. So, usually it gets about 5 to 25 rounds um, of rewriting a document before it might get an RFC. After this, after the reviewers from the other areas said it's fine, the working group said it's fine, um, it's sent for the Internet, Standard, uh, Internet Engineering Steering Group for review, which is, again, a group of people who are ATF veterans and uh, are elected by a very interesting process, um, who say, OK, we have an overview about most stuff going on at the ITF. We think it's a good idea and works. Or we say, oh, no, you have overlooked something. Please fix it at the following west. After the ISG review comes in, you send it to the RFC editor for publishing, and they will tweak a little bit of the wording, have a little additional rounds with you um, on how to fix details, and finally, if all references are fixed, if everything is fine, it gets published as an RFC. So, if you're asking where TAPS is at the moment, TAPS is at the moment here. We have it accepted as a working group item, and we are actively working on that, um, and we'll soon get the first reviews from other areas. So. For ITF work, it's quite early in the pipeline. So, what's the idea? How does it work? What are the idea principles? So, first, it's an event-driven API. So, modern networking APIs or networking applications work asynchronously. You always do select. You always have to look about several sockets and several connections. So, you don't want to block anywhere. And TAPS has nothing that blocks. So everything you do, whether you initiate a connection, you listen for incoming connections, read or write, 
if something's for you, you get an event. And whether the event is implemented as a callback or as a listener pattern object or some kind of work queue is totally up to the specific language implementation. Whatever fits into the language would, should be used to implement these kind of events. In addition, uh, if you're looking at the BSD socket API, it's really, really complicated to get information like uh, fire, uh, ICMP, um, ICMP blocked or ICMP uh, rejects. It's really hard to get in this information and TAPS is going to make this information easily available as events to the application too. The second basic idea, and that's why it's in the TAPS working group, it should enable protocol evolution. So we're focusing on what the application needs. The application doesn't say, I want a TCP socket, but the application says, I want a reliable in-order stream socket. And whether this is implemented as TCP or as quick or as SCTP, you don't care. You get the service you're asking for. And you can narrowly define with, with properties what you really need and the system makes a smart choice for you. Second, you want to be really flexible with connect connection establishment time. So you want to use happy eyeballs for everything, for protocol selection, so for transport protocol selection, for IP protocol selection, maybe also for endpoint selection. And if you have other preferences, so for example, you want to use the cheapest possible link or something like that, you just code this into the timeouts or the head start you give for the different kind of connections. So if you give a 30 millisecond head start for a certain link, these connections will establish first and will be used. But if the link is broken or if something else is br uh, broken there, just, uh, using the least preferred or the lesser preferred one, that has, doesn't have the head start. Still, you don't have to wait for some timeout. We just get a connection and it feels fast. And the third idea, um, you want to be flexible after connection establishment. And you want to use features that modern um, transport protocols bring you, like connection migration. If you change your IP address, you don't want to reconnect. You will just carry on with your uh, connection. You want to be able to use multipass if you have multiple links. And you want to be able to use multi-streaming to save connection time. So your application shouldn't care about whether you need to open a second TCP connection if you want a parallelism, or you open a sec an additional quick stream if you have quick available. And this all should be glossed over in tabs. And as the third main concept, we want to be able to do data transfer using messages. All interactions in model networking applications are message-based. Yes, you have a TCP socket that is, that's a stream, but you usually chop the streams into pair, uh, messages and work then on these messages. And therefore, we want to support framing and deframing de for protocol, message-based protocols on stream transports. Because we are not going to change the transports with tabs. We're just providing nicer interface to the existing one. That's also the reason why a TAP system can, without any problem, interact to, to any other system because we're not changing the protocols. We're just changing the way you're accessing the protocols. Um, it allows to control a lot of stuff on the individual messages that are available in the protocols but not exposed by the Socket API today, like deadlines. So, you, for example, in SCTP, you just might not want to transmit a message when the receiver isn't, hasn't any use for it anymore. So you can associate a deadline with a message and it might be dropped from the send buffer after this deadline is over. You might want to send certain messages unreliably because you don't care whether they arrive or don't care too much about the, whether they arrive. And you can all select this on a per message basis in a nice and suitable way. And it also allows you to assign messages to underlying transport connections for multi-streaming and for pool connections. So if you today open, have a web browser that opens a connection to some CDN node or to some other website, it opens a bunch of connections and distributes the requests among them. 
we can do this in the Socket API. And not, you don't have to implement it yourself. This should be done by a tab system. How do we realize this? We have two concepts that are central to do this. The first one is framers. Framers are pieces of code that allows you to chop a stream transport into individual messages. And the nice idea about this is you can just write a piece of code and then it integrates with the buffer management and back pressure management and you only get a message in your main application code once a complete message arrived or a chunk of the message if the messages are too large. But you can really implement this in a nice and sensible way. I think we should also be able to offload this, for example, to hardware. So if you have something, are able to offload a lot of stuff into your hardware, it might also look for the messages and only send the application in, in software interrupt when a whole message arrived for it. And finally, Um, this concept is mainly for chopping through stream protocols, but we might tweak it a little bit and we might be able to implement just simple protocols also within this framing layer. And finally, to control all that stuff, we need some mechanism. And this means to configuring our transport properties. So we have selection properties that influence pass and protocol selection. We have connection properties that influence per connection behavior and with message properties that influence permissions behavior. They just used like a dictionary and we have well-defined namespaces. So we have a default namespace for all stuff we are currently writing in this RFC. And we have different namespaces, for example, for transport protocol specific stuff, you just write TCP dot and then the property and you know, this transport property is only used if the connection is done using TCP. If it's done using quick, this is just ignored. So, how does this interaction work? So if we have this on a textual basis, we say, I want a connection to example or using HTTPS. Um, I need a reliable transport and please optimize for low latency. And the tab system says, oh yes, nice, here's a connection object. Um, now you now can send and receive your messages on this and you don't have to care about anything else. So it's not 1,200 lines of code, but it's about 20 lines of code to co establish that connection. So there is this nice ASCII art diagram from the architecture, uh, um, from the current draft that's saying basically the idea. So you start off over with a pre-connection. That's an object where you do all the, connect, the configuration on you want to connect. You specify a local endpoint, a remote endpoint, for example, a host name. You specify selection properties and you specify defaults for the connection and message properties. So you can, for example, say, we have, if, even if I get reliable protocols, I want all my messages sent unreliable if possible. You can already specify this in this stage. Then you go into the pre-connection. On the pre-connection, you can either call initiate and get a connection object once the connection is established, or you can call listen on it and get a listener object that is listening for your connections. Once this initiation works, you get an event. So in this case, a listener, you, you get a conne um, connection received event, or in this case, you get an initial completed event and have a connection object. On this, you can send, uh, can easily call send with a message. You receive messages, events out of that. And if you close, it goes to closed connection. Fairly simple. So how does this look in abstract code? So we have a remote specifier, say, I want a remote specifier. Uh, with the host name example com, with the service HTTPS, I want transport properties, reliable in order stream. This is a shorthand. You can also specify a bunch of um, properties on that you want reliable, that you want it in order, and so on. And you say, I want the capacity profile low latency added to it that you optimize to latency. Then you configure your security parameters 
for the encryption and create a pre-connection object with all these parameters. On the pre-connection, you can say, I want an HTTP framework that I just want to be want to get HTTP requests and responses as messages and don't want to care about anything else. And then say preconnection.initiate and get your connection object back. The connection object then sends you an event saying, oh, I'm ready, the connection is set up. And then you can send your messages. You can create a new message context, configure it, you want a lifetime of 200 milliseconds and TCP load delay if TCP is used. If not, you don't get it. And then you have the connection and can send a further. So, um, Teresa, who might be in the room here, um, and a few students of us, and I have written this Python async IO tabs as one example implementation, which is still on top of the BSD socket API, to just see whether this, how this fits into Python, and we see. Uh, have this as an example application that does exactly the same as the two slides before uh, of pseudocode did. So, we're not the only implementation at the moment. There is much more complete as our uh, Python implementation, uh, the Apple Network Framework, which is available since iOS 12 or 13, I guess. So it's, it was as a better in iOS 12 and it will now come in iOS 13 as default network communication framework. And it's based on the ideas of tabs. Um, and there are also some other projects which are neat and socket intense, which were pre-runners that gave input into the whole process, but you can get some ideas on what a tab system could do from these, frame, uh, from these implementations. But basically, if you want to use tabs today uh, and you're programming for iOS, you can just use Network Framework and you get most of the stuff I was talking about to you to today just today by using it. If you're interested in more stuff, um, the documents are um, in the ITF data tracker. So you can see it if you're interested to um, collaborate, if you have comments on that, subscribe the tabs mailing list from the date, ITF data tracker, and start discussing about that stuff. We love input, we love ideas, uh, we love if you see that there are problems because we really want to have the next generation socket API there. And therefore we need input of whether use cases are sort of or whether this works nicely. And if you want about the latest version, the latest discussion, there's also a GitHub repository where we also have GitHub um, most detailed discussions as GitHub issues. So if you have a NIT or if you found a, a right, um, spelling error in the documents, just make a GitHub issue and we'll take care of that. So with this, I'm finished with my talk and I'm happy to take questions. Hello? Hi. Yes. Sorry, we just had a technical problem. So, thank you so much. This was Phil's, and uh, we have uh, a bit time left for questions. So please uh, don't be shy and come to the microphones and uh, ask away. Thank you. You mentioned that the new API is supposed to include deadlines. Are these real, absolute deadlines or just timeouts? Uh, this is a good question. So. We don't think that anyone will really implement a real-time networking API because that's really, really hard. If someone is going into the area of deterministic networking where you can have real deadlines, this might be exposed as well as a transport property. But the, the timeouts I was seeing here are mostly advisory timeouts like, dear stack, we really don't need to retransmit this packet if it 
has lurked for about 300 milliseconds in the output buffer. So it could be real deadlines at some point in time, but at the moment we are just, or for the for actual implementations today, we're thinking about per message timeouts. Thank you so much. Next question, please. So, um, in your Python example, you awaited the send and then registered some sort of callback on receive after you awaited the send. That looked a bit weird for me. Why do you need to await the send if you use callbacks anyway? Um, you don't need to await it at this point in time. It was just in the example, but um, you don't need to await it in this moment. Ah. And maybe a related question. Um, so what kind of... You said you wanted to be protocol independent. And obviously there are many communication patterns that are interesting uh, beyond just bidirectional byte streams. So do you only plan to support bidirectional byte streams or something message oriented, broadcasting, what kind so, of? So um, as I already told in, in the talk, we are really looking about messages, if it's possible. Oh, okay. So um, the default interaction should be messages and we have the framers to chop a byte stream into messages. And that also should allow you to migrate from stream oriented transport like TCP to a real message-oriented transport once this is available in your current deployment scenario. Uh, if you're not looking about point-to-point, -point, uh, we have some people who joined the TAPS working group um, and uh, joined our work um, that are really looking about source-specific multicast. And we definitely want full multicast support within this API, but that's still at an early stage. That's not in most of the implementations yet, but it's coming. So it's definitely on our agenda to include multicast in a usable and nice way and in a portable way. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we have a question left. Yes, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, do you foresee already how much of the implementations will be uh, user mode and how many or which parts of the implementation will be user mode and which parts will be kernel mode, especially regarding the async parts, which are usually done differently on different operating systems? That's a very good question. Um, if you're looking at the implementations that are currently out there, so there's our Python implementation is mo mostly a wrapper, as the neat implementation also is mostly a wrapper uh, around the so socket API. The Apple implementation is actually doing most stuff in user mode, and it's just using the kernel mode for demultiplexing. Um, and I think this is the way it should go in the next years. So, on the other hand, I think seeing that both is possible should also allow an implementation to change that some, at some point in time. So hopefully it's possible to start with wrapper on the BSD socket API and go to some user space networking implementation at a later point in time without changing the API to the application. That's what we hope to achieve. Thank you so much. So um, thank you so much to Phil, and please give him a great round of applause.